Well, welcome everybody to Behind the Couch. We are LA Not So Confidential. I'm Dr. Shiloh. I'm here with Dr. Scott. And it's our first one of 2022, finally. So um, we're back and we have a very good show tonight. It might be a little longer than our normal hour. So yeah, you guys can us. hang in there. Um, I promise you it will be worth it. There are double the amount of podcast hosts here today. So, <laughs> um, and our guests have episodes that are as long as ours, if not longer, in their own show. So, before I get to them, get to introduce them. Hello, Dr. Scott. How are you? Hello, Dr. Shiloh. How are you doing in the <laughs> in the windy climbs of eastern Los Angeles County? I'm making it happen. I am um, going on 12 hours without power, but um, fortunately, I found a place to land to do this. So making it work. I got a generator today, which just makes me that much more prepped for the zombie apocalypse. So <laughs> yes. I'm feeling good about it. Um, okay. Patreon members, we have a few new ones to announce. So we're going to do that and then we'll do our January merch drawing. And that person is going to get one of our challenge coins. So our new Patreon members are Kristen V, Diana R, Kylie Y, Lauren M, Tracy C, Ira, and Corey C. So thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I was thinking today, Scott, basically Patreon makes it so you and I don't have to work on weekends, like take clients in our private practice at this point. I mean, we get to do this instead. So yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. It's so, pretty great. Yes, you guys are all our clients instead. You save me one tenth of the this this show saves me one tenth of the trauma that I get from the rest of my work. So, there <laughs> oh, we Jesus. go. <laughs> Does it though? <laughs> Does it? The, the show we're going to talk about or the case Ooh, today. Oh boy, and yeah, we have to and the the uh, how we got here too, which is right. kind of amazing. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, so let me spin the wheel for our Patreon January merch winner here. And it starts all over. Everyone's back in the pool starting at the beginning of the year. So we have Jen H. So Jen, I will be in touch and you're going to get a challenge coin. Cool, cool. Hey, Jen. I don't think Jen has won before. That's great. I don't think she has cool. either. So that's awesome. And there's a lot of people there. You know, it was good to be a, a Patreon member last year when you weren't up against everyone who joined Patreon since. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, let's get into it since uh, we have a lot to cover today, Yeah. but I want to introduce our two guests that are here um, from the LA Meekly podcast. We have Los Angeles born comedians, Greg Gonzalez with two Z's Hi. and <laughs> Daniel Zafran, which I always want to say, Daniel Zac Efron. Is that like, is that okay to call you that? <laughs> I'm, it's apparently because everybody, call, I don't know why, but everybody wants to call me. Zac why Efron. does our brain do that? Like, I see your last name and I just see Zac Efron. People also call me Zach. Like, they just call me Zach and they oh, that's know crazy. that's not my name and they just, <laughs> they just call me Zach. How do I you mean, react to that? Do you like go, I just, go off on him ever or? I just, fine, whatever. I'm sad. <laughs> I'm sad. <laughs> Don't call I'm, me that. I'm sad, Zach. <laughs> there's not even, there's not even a K or a C in your last name. Like it. Yeah. I, I don't get it. I don't look like a Zach. I look like, as we discussed, William Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> well. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I want you guys to tell our audience about your show, how you came up with the idea, how, maybe how even, you know, you guys know each other, but literally you guys have been podcasting like forever. So, which is, I mean, so long and, um, <laughs> which is, it's, it it's in. incredible. No, I know. I know. <laughs> it's, it's for us, like, that's incredible to think about what you're going, I, on your 10th year i think wow it, it, i think we're we're still in the time frame of an eighth year, year but we're oh, in the it. ninth oh, right. okay. we're in the ninth calendar year got it got it right 
God, it's you're still a long time. <laughs> yeah. For yeah, it's not that yeah. long. Or it's not 10 years, it's nine years. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, yeah, it's a really yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah well, tell us about your show. Or... Right, right. Uh, History we... podcast? Are we? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Great. We're an Natalie History podcast. Um, Daniel's my best friend. I met him at CSUN. We were both in a writing class together. So sweet. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we started the podcast about 2013. Um, we had been listening to Bowery Boys, which is the New York History podcast. Yeah. It was kind of a similar thing to us. We kind of just decided that we wanted to do that for LA. There, I had been getting, yeah, there was no... Yeah. There was no LA history podcast, and even since then, there's only really uh, there, there's there's none dedicated like exclusively just to well, except for the hidden history of Los Angeles. But like right. we, we thought, we were filling a a little uh, void, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> we've been filling that void for eight calendar year, nine calendar years now. <laughs> well, there is no LA history podcast. There's only like four podcasts out there in 2013, right? <laughs> Right. I know it's it's weird to think about when I when I hear about other like very you know like uh what is it uh, what is it uh, the Karina Longworth one um oh you must you, remember this oh, and, yes yeah and like she started what like five years after us <laughs> whoa it, it it's, it's really podcast. weird to to think about that but yeah we've been doing it a long long time oh mm-hmm. my gosh that's that's incredible um so how tell me a little bit about the topics you guys bounce back and forth between like how do you choose the topics for your shows a little bit about the process i have like a little notebook i wish i had it it's in the other room but it has every fact about los angeles history in it like i i just (laughs) write down every possible topic we could do in there and then at the like at the beginning of the month i just pepper greg with suggestions or see if he has any yeah i'll get a text about hot dogs i'm like okay (laughs) (laughs) well (laughs) what do you think about bank robberies and like okay let's fine let's do bank robberies (laughs) we sometimes go ahead we sometimes try to like match it up if there's like like uh, if there's like a holiday in that month we've occasionally tried to do something but there's only so many times we can talk about like it's the big arbor day episode that we're doing <laughs> where are palm trees from <laughs> very good and question so what about research wise like how do you guys sort of split it i know we always get that question like well what's your research process like and we're like you don't even want to know <laughs> but <laughs> how, how do you guys usually manage that it, it's ideally the episodes for example hot dogs are ones mm-hmm. where it could be like okay you're gonna cover pinks uh i'll cover carnies and like there's individual topics and that mm-hmm. kind of makes it easier to delineate like i'll do these three things you'll do those three things but there have been a few where it's been uh like a like the water wars one we yeah. have to figure out like i'll cover uh, when people liked William Mulholland, and you'll cover when people <laughs> yeah. hated William Mulholland. Right. But but then it's for me. I just like I I go I scour the internet for everything I can find and uh, some books. Although I try to stay away from most books because I get too involved in them and it uh, eats up all of my research. Because we only have yeah. what like three two three weeks to yeah yeah because yeah, you guys I put feel... out one a month right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a monthly podcast. And to go off what Daniel's saying, yeah, when I sit and read an entire book, I come back with way too like I basically would just like oh, it's been horrible as oh, my yeah. as my segment. I'm just yeah. like, and then William Faulkner went to the movies for a third day in a row, and he's like, oh, no, I don't need to know this. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, I find myself jotting down way too much, but um, I, I think I guess that's part of it is you have to find out like what are the golden nuggets to like right. bring your yeah. audience because um, there, also yeah. there's just so much. And also what you can't trust on the internet, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> which is most of it. <laughs> right. Well, even, we, I feel like I mean, we do big the, disclaimers. Even yeah. the contradictions you'll find in like in books. I mean, we're going to be oh, yeah. pulling a lot from a book today. Mm-hmm. And there are things that are incongruent in newspapers.com. Like you're, we can right. go, you know, best subscription ever, by the way. 
like right. I'm like yes. reading newspapers from 1924. Yeah. <laughs> It's wild. Um, yeah. So I think I, that's one of the things we always try and do is like say, look, the farther it goes back in history, the more you have to give it a caveat and right, yeah, and just yeah. be aware that like it's a big game of whispers every decade. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, we're hearing this like tenth generation down. Of what <laughs> right. happened. Yeah, but for us, it works to our advantage because when we look at kind of psychological profiles we can be like well we can be a little more willy-nilly because all these people are dead <laughs> and <laughs> nobody's gonna sue rule. us <laughs> yeah. if we say that they yeah. are you know we live by the golden rule that if they're dead they can't sue us <laughs> it, love it yeah it's it's a good mantra for history podcasts for sure <laughs> um and what do you guys do for your day jobs because is one of you still out of state no we're no both, i was we're only right there now? temporarily Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. We we both work in libraries. <laughs> yeah, different library systems. Different yeah. libraries. Yeah. Got it. Got so it. So we're around books a lot. So we usually, yeah. you know, we'll be on a break and be like, okay, I got to read. I got to, you got to read three paragraphs of this book on the third floor real quick and then I can go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> or not even on a break and just sitting there when I'm supposed to be doing other things. Well, uh, yeah, on the I clock. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the portable Kindle app within a browser is really useful. <laughs> We've heard. You know, just We've heard. Fake, <laughs> fake typing. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm working. I'm working. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the report I've ever typed up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have a bunch of pictures up from the Marion Parker murder at work. That's... No. Oh, well smart yeah yeah what are these tabs here oh no <laughs> yeah it gets really dicey on certain topics when i'm doing research at work and it's like i nobody can walk by right now because this is this is not yeah. a pretty part of history yes yeah. yes yes um and i know that i think in our last episode when i was kind of talking about that we were going to be doing this i was like how how did i discover these guys and i realized what it was it's when i was doing research on the um missing deputy oj case like not many people have covered that and huh. so your show was was one that i came across interesting yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah oh and then i was like what earthquakes i love natural disasters <laughs> like i'm hooked we, I'm we've covered a lot of topics i think the earthquakes one made me the most afraid <laughs> Oh, just really? About like, oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, everything was just on the ground. Like, what? The ha what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Four exactly. Buildings collapsed on each other. You know, like, yeah. uh, oh. And okay. the people weren't in there, were they? Oh, no, they were in there. Oh, no. Oh, they were. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that the anniversary of Northridge was just yeah. what, last week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The anniversary. Because of, of my calendar. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys have a calendar that you can go by, go to their website, which I'm going to put in the uh, chat here. Um, and every single day has a piece of LA history on it, which is probably from Daniel's notebook. I'm guessing. Yeah, it absolutely it's is. It's just a photocopy <laughs> of my notebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. Brilliant, brilliant merch idea. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I'm wondering like for next year, like, is history going to, I'm going to have 365 different days of history. From... <laughs> yeah. So this is the first year you've done the calendar. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Very we'll cool. We'll see how much history changes by 2023. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> well, should we get into our topic? We should. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, why don't um, you, uh, you want to give a trigger warning? Maybe definitely want to give a trigger warning for our current listeners. And as this gets preserved on different formats that uh, we will be talking about uh, child murder and uh, dismemberment. It is pretty brutal, not necessarily focusing a lot of time on that, but it is um, despite it being a hundred years ago, this feels like a very modern type of crime in its brutality. That's yeah. what I would say. So one thing I want to say about how I prepped for this is that there's a really, really great book that Shiloh and I both read slash listened to. I pulled a great deal of information from that as well as other research source resources. And I, in order to, to get through what we're getting through, wrote a lot of narrative. So I'm going to be reading what I've, what I've written, um, which is not usually how we do things here on Get Vocal. We're usually pretty much off the cuff but I wanted to um, to get in as much information because like Greg, like you were saying, I totally went into a rabbit hole on this one 
so much information that is just fascinating. Yeah. And um, another, this will be another one of our recommended readings, um, especially for history buffs about Los Angeles. This one and how it ties into the Wineville chicken coop murder murders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's there's a lot of uh, nexus here for crime in the early 20s, which is disturbing. So. Here we go. On December 15th, 1927, 12-year-old Marion Parker was kidnapped from her school in Los Angeles by a young man with an elaborate plan and a hunger for money. And after days of demanding, accusatory, and directive communication with Marion's father, against the advice of police, he paid the oddly amount, <laughs> the oddly um, chosen amount of ransom. In a furtive meeting in the early morning hours on a secluded residential street, Marion's father was delivered, unfortunately, her crudely and cruelly mutilated body. The crime sent an absolute shockwave through not only the West Coast population of the U.S., but across the country. School attendances dropped precipitously due to the manner in which Marion was easily abducted, and a statewide manhunt with major missteps and setbacks electrified the nations through newspapers, radio, and the new technology of talking newsreels in theaters. It also wildly messed up both the prosecution and the defense when it came mm -hmm. to trial. Now, after managing to flee the state, the new forensic science lab led to the identification of William Edward Hickman, who was subsequently arrested for the kidnap and murder of Marion Parker. After attempting the first insanity defense in California, he was found guilty and hanged at San Quentin prison. So before we kind of move on to a breakdown of the story, um, I was wondering if you guys can give us just kind of a rundown of what L.A. was like in the 20s, just to set the scene a little bit for us. Well, the first step is conservative as hell. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> The, the 20s is, I think, when we became a modern city. Like, we had the population boom, you know, it skyrocketed after World War I. Um, there was a lot of corruption with the police department and City Hall. The City Hall gang, which was the, I think it was called the Combination, was fully active during the 20s. So the police were just getting direct orders from uh, the shadow mayor, who was Kent Kane, Kent Kane Peratt, I believe his name was. Uh, and he was just running vice but pretty much through the police. So there was, yeah. you know, that was a bad time for, that was the bad time for the cops. Um, <laughs> anything you want to add to that? No, well, well yeah. I, Daniel. just real quick, I was yeah. on the phone um, with a guy at the, the, the historian, the deputy that runs the LA County Sheriff's Museum mm -hmm. before Scott and I went down there. He was just giving me a little rundown and he was like, Actually, at that time, the sheriff's department was like straight and narrow. He's like, really? but LAPD, they were the fucked up ones. <laughs> like the, anything and everything, you know, which is yeah. something Scott and I have talked about, especially with like the Wineville chicken coop murder yeah. and all, you know, all the same people at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Which me and Greg were talking about the that the chicken coop thing before this. And he keeps referring to it as the change, the what the changeling is based on. And I keep thinking he's talking about the George C. Scott. C. Changeling. Scott. <laughs> and I'm like, With the necklace in the, the necklace in the grave that like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, Angelina Jolie. Come on. Uh, today's George C. Scott, Angelina Jolie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but after the... watching Eternals last night, I would absolutely yeah. agree. She's the new George C. Scott. <laughs> Critics are unanimous. Yeah. Angelina Jolie is George C. Scott. <laughs> Uh, the other things I had is that, like you were saying, the population was going crazy because like yeah. the boosters were all saying, everybody, it's better here. Come move here. Mm -hmm. So everyone was coming here. Cars were coming here. Yeah. Uh, the city was starting to spread out and become the, like the sprawl that it is now. Mm -hmm. And everyone was just kind of in their own world because like you could live on this ranch in San Fernando or something. And there's people you will never have as that are living downtown. And it right. was like we were coming out of the wild, wild west days. And like you were saying, starting to like trying to become like a respectable city in the eyes of the rest of the country, which just means New York City. And that meant that, <laughs> oh, that to to to, to uh, apparently that just meant being conservative and racist because that was like 
yeah the the law of yeah. the land and they were like it was it, like the city was trying to become legitimate which is why what was about to happen did not look good for that image yeah yeah this, definitely yeah this dead girl does not help us at all no, yeah. no. This and is then very it spreads Chicago. like wildfire yeah, very yeah. Chicago. absolutely you know there's a whole thing in this book that i won't i won't i promise i won't go in this rabbit hole but how <laughs> this particular crime had such an effect on the movie industry and the movie right. industry was exploding and it was huge anyway because they could film seven days a week because of the weather here mm -hmm. and then talkies came in and mayor louis b mayor who ran the entertainment city yeah. was like what the fuck's gonna happen now because of this murderer who supposedly lived in the dark theater just entranced yeah. by crime movies eating popcorn and <laughs> You know, it was a big deal. It was like, yeah. that's why we have the Hayes Code or why we did have the Hayes Code for yeah. many years. Yeah. Yeah. I have notes on that too, but I don't know if you want to get into that now before. Let's, I guess let's we should kind of save yeah. it. At, yeah. Let's It'll see how much we can sense. get through. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you're right. It will make more sense yeah. later too. Um, fantastic. Anything else on just kind of that time period? Um, just to no. kind of go. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, to go along with what Daniel was saying, boosterism was high, and a lot of it because of the it was also conservative because of Harry Chandler from the LA Times, who was also pushing everything. So this big tie between you know City Hall gang, the police was also the uh, the end of the triangle was Harry Chandler. I feel like mm. that's a big part of the twenties. Yeah, that's too. that's yeah. I couldn't remember which Chandler or Otis Harry. it was, but yeah, they were so <laughs> the L.A. Times was just so conservative. Yeah, so much so that they got bombed by liberal right. uh, liberal union activists. <laughs> yeah, Scott and I we they talked about that when we took our group on a walking tour of downtown L.A. and oh wow, covered that. So yeah, it's crazy. Uh, have you guys covered that on your show? A yeah. long, long time ago. <laughs> oh, good. Cool, cool. Yeah. Well, um, so I'll do a little breakdown of the kidnapping and um, the events that followed after that. And so essentially this took place on the morning of December 15th. And this very brazen suspect basically walks into Mount Vernon Junior High School, um, which is now Johnny Cochran Junior High or Middle School and tells the front desk receptionist that he was sent to pick up the younger Parker daughter, and I do that in air quotes, um, because her father had been in a horrible car accident. And he was a well-dressed young man. He stated that he was a coworker from the First National Bank where Mr. Parker worked, gave them the phone number to the bank to, if they, case, you know, they wanted to call and confirm. Uh, Scott and I even got some information that he still had his credentials because he actually had worked there as a page at one point. Right. So he might yeah. have shown them to him. And at first, the, the front desk staff points out, well, you ask for the younger daughter, but the girls are twins. <laughs> and then he says, oh, well, I mean, I mean the smaller one. Which the one I'm that sorry, was born three like, seconds earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry, like no red flags are yeah, going that's a up huge to the staff. <laughs> like, okay, you just want one first off, and then you're just like, I meant the, you know, give me the little one. Yeah, and they do. They they bring Marion up to the front um, front desk, uh, front lobby of the school. He very like empathetically bends down, gets down on her level, tells her what happened to her father, tells her that everything's going to be okay, you know, not to cry. He's going to take care of her um, and he's there to take her to go see her dad. So she quietly goes with him and she's gone and no one thinks anything of it until she's supposed to show up at home after school. But the, the day kind of goes on. He eventually tells her his intentions. I'm actually, your father's fine. I'm going to hold you for ransom and that you're going to be back with your family in no time. So this man, um, once, once she doesn't come home from school and the other daughter does, the police are notified immediately. 
the mother faints upon hearing that her daughter has been kidnapped from school and kind of everything's in the works after that. But now it's been several hours. And this man was named, as Scott told us at the top, William Hickman. He was 19 years old. He had actually previously worked with Mr. Parker. So that's how he picked him out to be somebody that he thought he could get a ransom from. He had a little bit of knowledge. This this bank that they worked at was in downtown LA. It's at 7th and Spring Street. The building's still there. I couldn't tell whether it's the one where the CVS is in or the one where the Terramia Coffee is in now. The buildings right. both look very similar. Um, <laughs> but it's one of those buildings that's still there. Um, and he had first thought that he was going to kidnap the president of the bank's daughter, but she was way too young and he just didn't really want to deal with a toddler. So um, he went after Mr. Parker because he knew that he had two daughters and that he could also afford the ransom. So that that's it, it's lead, when I read about this and looking through our lens, this is a very organized, well-planned mm -hmm. Um, kidnapping yeah. that's taking place, you know, later we'll get into, you know, what he, we already said that it was a first try at an insanity plea, yeah. but this is very, very organized. Um, there's a lot of thought put into this. So Scott, you want to tell us a little bit more about Hickman? Right. So this may be the big crime, but even at the age of, he was almost 20, even at this age, he definitely had a background and a background that was, intensely um occurring within that two and a half year period because literally there was nothing prior in his schooling in his high school that would indicate that he was going to be leading towards this life of crime and i mean that term gets used a lot but it really was hickman grew up in a small town in arkansas in the early 20th century probably left a lot to be desired there you know you think about 1923, 24 in that part of the country, it's going to be pretty rural. Um, the LAPD detectives, Lucas and Raymond, that later were able to build this timeline on his um, escalating numbers of crimes over the past three years, found that he had begun at the age of 17. He and a childhood friend robbed a candy store in Kansas. They were feeling pretty chuffed with themselves. The two, you know, nascent criminals now to use the money from the crime to finance a trip to the West Coast. So they were like, great, we got some money. This is going to get us to the West Coast. They get on the road and realize, oh, this is not nearly enough money to get us anywhere. <laughs> so they just start. It's a string of crimes across the country. Yeah. Um, getting to Hollywood proved to be more expensive than the candy <laughs> store could provide. It always so is. They got a, did they realize we were successful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were successful there. So they just made a series of store robberies, yeah. um, completing at yeah, least store. 12 that are known, but it may have been more. Once they got across the Cal, um, they attempted to rob a pharmacy, not knowing that there was a police officer present. And it escalated very quickly. There was rapid and unexpected gunfire. Hickman killed the pharmacist and he seriously wounded the police officer. And because this was the first time that they hadn't gotten away with the robbery, um, because everything else had been pretty successful, it yeah. freaked him out a little bit. And they decided, okay, we're gonna go straight. We're gonna get jobs. <laughs> so- That was crazy. <laughs> What's that was crazy, man. Boy, I killed somebody. Let me get a job at a bank. Um, so they go- That was just the thing I needed to go straight. Yeah, so now really. I can live a normal life. She Thank you for teaching me that lesson, dead man. <laughs> um, so they get hired at this bank, um, but then very quickly arrested and convicted for fraud after money started disappearing from the till. Oh, right. And um, he got, his friend got um, charged uh, more severely. And when Hickman had done his time in jail, he went back to the bank and reapplied for a job. And they were like, Hell no, get out of here. <laughs> so he had no money. He ended up um, going back home, uh, I think by bus or something or, or train at the time and had to go back to Kansas. Uh, was it Kansas or Arkansas? No, now he goes back to Kansas and he gets a job at a local movie theater as an usher. Mm -hmm. um, Hickman was not a regular work schedule kind of guy, apparently. 
Hmm. He did not like no working way. a regular schedule. <laughs> or he may be, and we'll talk about this later about mental health issues, he may have actually been suffering with a form of bipolar disorder where he would go into depressive states where he literally couldn't get out of bed, which would then be alternating with semi-manic or full-on manic states, which would sort of support the idea of some of his behaviors later on. Anyway, um, he was getting a little bit bored with this, not making enough money. And because he was out of the state of the California, there were no records for gun purchases. He ends up buying quite a number of guns and committing 43 armed robberies in five different states. He oh. had one goal in mind, and that goal was to get the fuck out of Kansas. <laughs> um, his success in robbery. Support. Yeah. Yeah, well... <laughs> No place he like was that? very successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So middle of 1927, uh, November, he mm -hmm. gets back to uh, Los Angeles. Now, in the book, Not Just Evil, they make a big deal out of his mental health. The reason they make a big deal of his mental health is they're going for a particular defense when it all comes down. We're going to talk about how he got caught. But yeah. one of the things that came up that, like we were talking about earlier, kind of gets shrouded in the mists of time and shrouded in the motivations of prosecution and defense, which have a tendency to kind of choose a narrative. Yeah. Um, his mother had been put into an asylum after having a break. That break followed um, his father abandoning the family and starting another family. So there was definitely some that he mm -hmm. experienced growing up, uh, but the, the, the core big deal out of he had a grandmother with epilepsy and his mother was insane. And so he had hereditary insanity and, right. you know, all of the very primitive views of psychology at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely he had a history of depression, social isolation and some issues in connecting with others. Definitely no issue, issues disconnecting somebody later on. Get oh. it? <laughs> Sorry. Oh. The these are those jokes we were talking about of why we can't run for Congress. At least right. Scott went there first and he's a doctor. I know. At least I get it. I broke the ice. It's 100 years old. And oh, oh boy. Ice. Here like, I come. Um, let me get like, my oh, list thank out. God. Like, so, I have another the, book of jokes about murdered children. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ooh, ow, ow. Um, while Hickman's attorneys attempted to paint a challenging and traumatic past for him, Prosecution wasn't having it. Their interview and research into his background indicated actually very little support to support this sort of, um, I mean, I'm, I'm using the word trauma, but they would not have really have used it in the way that we use it today. Right. But there, yes, there was a history of divorce and stress, including his mom's brief psychiatric stint. Um, but otherwise, like interviews with his schoolmates didn't find anything extraordinary about him at all. Yeah, yeah I feel like um, there was a lot of, talk and I, I don't know if it was in the book Scott or like other articles I had read where you know they made this big deal that he could never like he never had a girlfriend he never really connected with women um and be, there was a lack of there there wasn't any indication of sexual assault when this crime yeah happened so um that kind of came up later I think detectives were asking his friends like well like has he ever been weird with women and they're like well never really <laughs> like had any connection or any girlfriends or anything like that. What a so, dork. <laughs> what a dork. Oh my God. He, yes, Emily. I'm actually, the... sorry, a... Emily, just, sorry. she's like a parka. You put on a parka. I'm sitting in a garage. <laughs> it was, so anyway, it was a, Beautiful it was garage. a nice blast of color that came through. Cause right? everything else, we're all kind of muted right now. <laughs> <It's all gray. laughs> um, anything else to add you guys? Um, I didn't want to cut anyone off or with Oh, just or just to go off of what Daniel's saying, uh, if you look at pictures of Hickman, he is a dork. He just got a, a pasty, milky face. He's a dork. That's all. I agree with everybody. He's a dork. <laughs> uh, excellent hair, though. He had really oh, good yeah. hair. beautiful hair. Weird old pompadour. <laughs> yeah. 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 And there was some talk about, um, uh, I'll save it. I'm like, oh. jumping ahead. Here I go. Never mind. <laughs> all right. Back on track, back to the kidnapping and murder. Um, so Hickman has little Marion, who, according to his confessions, she's very pleasant. She really isn't showing that she's scared. Um, he stated that she was 
perfectly polite. She was satisfied that he would return her to her family eventually. So he has her in the car the day that he kidnaps her from school and they drive all around town. They go to Glendale, they go to Pasadena, they go to, okay, Daniel, Azusa. Um, <laughs> I, they drive I, to that. <laughs> someone, slow for him? <laughs> someone uh, commented on something that we posted explaining the proper way to say it is like an old bicycle, like Azusa. So there now it's, I'll never mispronounce it again. <laughs> you can learn. Yes, <laughs> yes. I just... In relation to a wacky noise, yes, I can learn anything. <laughs> yes. So for everyone, Daniel had a hard time pronouncing <laughs> the name of the city. Azusa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they sort of circle back through the San Gabriel Valley and go to Alhambra, where he mails some letters and sends mm -hmm. some telegrams to sort of kick off the ransom process. And then they have head to South Pasadena and go to the movies at the Rialto Theater, which is still there. It's actually a, a church now. Mm -hmm. And he claims that they watched the movie, the vaudeville before. He said that they laughed together while they were eating their snacks. Um, and then he returns to his apartment, which is in just, just sort of near... Um, it's like between downtown LA and Elysian Park. It's and uh, Angelino Heights, actually, that little pocket right there. Perfect. Greg knows that building very well. I do. Know really? I used to, yeah, my high school was around the corner of Beaudry, so I used to walk ah! that building all the time. And it was uh, the setting of many short stories from high school, and then uh, years later found out that that's where Hickman killed Marion Barker, and I was very uh, surprised by that. Yes, I yeah. drive by that school all the time. Um, Do you? Because I, I work right <laughs> at Temple and Fig. So. Oh, really? Um, oh, wow. And then I have to drive up to Elysian Park every once in a while. So yeah, yeah. Cool. I didn't. It's I've been nice working building. from home, so I haven't been able to drive by. Um, I think it's called the Brownstone Lofts now. But I think uh, so. But yeah. The, the building's still there where yeah, the where he there. lives. And we'll we'll get to a little tidbit that Scott and I learned about the building too more recently. Oh, um, but so they go back to his apartment for the night. The uh, Parker family does receive the telegrams, a pair of telegrams, and they are signed by George Fox. So Hickman is calling himself the Fox at the end of these uh, communications with the family, and basically the telegrams tell the family stand by for further communication and ransom demands and warn the father Perry Parker, Perry Parker. to not interfere Peter with Parker. the kidnap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, the, he was in uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, don't interfere with his plans and essentially don't contact the police, which it's like too late. Sorry. Like yeah. you need to get your telegrams or some form of communication there quicker because that's already been done hours yeah. before. Um, so the, that's what happens on sort of day one, day two, the family then receives the first letter from the Fox and the note began with a header that was meant to spell the word death across the top using Greek characters. Um, and it goes on to say, quote, Fox is my name. Very sly, you know, Get this straight. Your daughter's life hangs by a thread and I have a Gillette ready and able to handle the situation, end quote. So a Gillette razor um, is what he's referring to. The best a man can get. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, um, back at Hickman's apartment, Marion, you know, after being very well behaved on first the first day, understandably, she wakes up just sobbing and right. he just kind of like leaves her alone for a while, not knowing exactly how to tend to this 12 year old child. And then he tries reassuring her that things are going to be okay. But clearly, I mean, she's starting to realize the scariness of this situation. Yeah. Um, and he, he ends up leaving the apartment, but he leaves her tied to a chair and in the apartment. And so he goes downtown to mail another letter to the parents that this time it includes a note written by Marion. So he's sort of putting this personal touch on mm -hmm. it. Um, 
so this second ransom note includes the ransom demands and again has this like heading where it says death at the top and it demands fifteen hundred dollars in twenty dollar gold certificates and he wants them to be prepared to deliver them that night and then he signs the note fox fate which i don't know like he's you can't, this, this you is, can't just keep throwing names on there you know stick to one name zodiac had one change yeah it <laughs> <laughs> George Fox, yeah Fox, what is it yeah right do you right right can can i ask you a quick question about this of course do you believe that she actually was well behaved and they got along or do you think that that was just him trying to be like yeah we had a good time during a confession because i i the, that was for me this whole thing it was like oh they got along up to the point where he had to kill her but do you think that that was true i i don't know i, I this is all through his confession and exactly, his words yeah. right like we never yeah. got any other account um he even talks about like leaving the car and her in the car going to like mail something at one point and she mm -hmm. just stayed in the car um, Scott and I talk a lot about victims and how they act and how yeah. people just general and act when it comes mm -hmm. to trauma. And a lot of the times people don't act like we think they're supposed to act. Right. And if she was just sticking to this idea of as long as I, you know, am okay and I'm a good girl or whatever, like everything's going right. to be fine. I think it is believable, you know, okay. from that standpoint, Scott, right. what do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I, he's this this guy is not even though they're going to try and say he's psychotic he's yeah. he's an organized intelligent although clearly emotionally immature young man right. but he's also like we see in a lot of offenders against children he, there's something about him that's very childlike including his physical right. stature Bingo. he's very short so it's very likely she that he could modulate his his emotions and his tones he was clearly like there's a lot going on for him, but he was able mm -hmm. to manage it until he couldn't manage it. Mm -hmm. So right. I don't I, I kind of believe it. Like even okay. the tone of the letters at first, I thought, now, is he dictating the letters to her or is right. she actually writing these? And they, I, you know, it's hard to tell. But I mean, clearly yeah. it's like he was organized, but there would have been many other options besides snapping and then making the decision to to brutally kill her yeah he could have gone down and bought like laudanum or something across the counter mm -hmm. at the pharmacist the one that he didn't kill the pharmacist yeah um <laughs> and you know kept her sedated or something like that he, right. he chose a different route though and the weird companionship thing like yeah taking her to the movies and hanging out with her is very very odd so you know look we also talk about like the the four f's uh uh flight fright freeze and fornicate mm -hmm. and freeze is a very big it's a big one that we don't talk about very much yeah. And yeah that's what she's doing is she's frozen in fear and her defense mechanism very well could be like well he's told me he's not going to hurt me and he hasn't hit me so i'm going to go right. with that yeah. how old was she 12 12 12 12 yeah yeah can we can we all agree that he had pretty nice handwriting <laughs> yes yes it, it, exactly he he like drew, it was weird like he it was almost like a like a comic at times like he had like little <laughs> wavy oh, lines word bubbles? around yeah uh, basically like around like the word fate and there was like sun rays mm -hmm. going off of it why tell me why <laughs> why is it, why did he do that to me that's very reminiscent of the um narrative placards in silent films and remember this was yeah um mm. a, the period ending of the period of silent films i thought of that like with the Good little catch. like radiant radiant lines and emphasis oh or as they say emphasis I like that. <laughs> Please don't ever say that. <laughs> oh no, I've been so saying it note... wrong this whole time. Yeah. So the the note from Marion um basically it, it, to her parents was begging them to comply and she warned that Hickman had already threatened to kill her and she wrote quote please daddy i want to come home tonight your loving daughter Marion Parker so what he returns to the apartment after he's had her tied up there and basically she tells him how she likes to go driving like just driving around 
which could be a tactic on her end to be like, okay, at least like get me out of this apartment because something yeah. scary could happen if it's just us, which the total conjecture, right? But yeah. like that could be really smart of her to just, but I don't know, maybe she just liked driving. And so yeah. she said, let's go drive around. Um, so they really just kind of spent that day out and about. They again sort of go out to San Gabriel and then they head south through Santa Ana and then down to San Juan Capistrano um, and then like circle back up to L.A. So um, it's a nice day. <laughs> it's a nice day. I'm thinking like, God, that would take forever now. Yeah, back, yeah. back then. But I also mean, back then. <laughs> yeah. This so, car goes you know, 20 miles per hour. Yeah, the jalopy <laughs> chugging along. Yeah, right. And now we would just be sitting on, um, you know, like eight different freeways to do that. <laughs> Staring at the Matterhorn from the whatever. <laughs> right, right. It's the right. Five, right. The whatever, I don't go down there. <laughs> That's Orange County. It's none of my business down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unless you're going to Disneyland, there's no no reason. They don't we wear masks down there. Um, <laughs> um, so he comes back to L.A. and he comes back there specifically to make the first phone call to right. uh, Marianne's father. So he talks to Mr. Parker tells him where and when to meet for the the ransom exchange that's going to happen that night. And here we are kind of like at the, what everyone thinks is like the peak of, of what's going to happen with the situation. We know the police are involved at this point. So Parker does drive to the location that night. He, he has all of the gold certificates on him and he tells the cops like, stay away. Let me handle this because this is what the kidnapper demanded and I want this to go well. I want my daughter. But unbeknownst to him, they end up surveilling him and the location. And Parker waits and waits and waits where the where Hickman wanted him to go, which is kind of Korea town-ish now. Right. And the kidnapper never shows. I mean, imagine like it getting to that point and then him just not showing up and how that was for her dad. I mean, it yeah. awful, awful stuff. So it's kind of a wash for that night. Um, that night goes by day three. Now, um, Hickman sends Parker a note saying how he saw the police. He named the streets that they were on. He described their cars. He talks about how Marion was with him and saw all this and cried when she realized she wouldn't be going home that night. I mean, he starts laying the yeah. guilt trip on really, really thick to Mr. Parker at this point. He says in his note, I will be two billion times as cautious and clever as deadly from now on. You have brought this on yourself and deserve it worse. A man who betrays his love for his own daughter is a second Judas many times more wicked than the worst modern criminal, which is very interesting because <laughs> strange math, but yeah, talking about himself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so Hickman said that basically uh, it, through his confession letters, he said that he then tells Marion and assures Marion, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just kind of writing this stuff to, you know, let them know that I'm serious about not having the police follow. And again, he's going to leave the apartment this day and he has her tied up and blindfolded. And he says that he's about to leave the apartment and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the urge to kill her just overcame him. And he first went and got a rolling pin out of the kitchen and decided against using that to beat her with and instead ended up getting a dish towel and just came up behind her without her knowing and strangles her and said that it took a couple minutes for her to die, which we know strangulation takes a very long time. Um, he said two minutes. I mean, it, it usually is more around like seven minutes to strangle someone but this this is an adult man with a child so it could be shorter um but he immediately puts her in the her body in the bathtub dismembers her sort of systematically like mm -hmm. drains the blood out of her body um and he puts her upper torso and 
pieces of her body into a suitcase. And he ends up then writing like an addendum to the letter that he was going to go mail. And it's titled final, titled final chance. Um, so again, he's, he's keeping with that. She's still alive and um, sends that off to, to the parents along with another note from Marion that she had, had written already. And then he goes to the movies and he says that he just wept during the entire show because uh, it was sort of sinking in what he had done. And then he goes and dumps her body parts in Elysian Park, the, um, her arms, her legs, essentially everything from like her yeah. belly button down because he had kind of bisected her. Um, and he hung on to the top part of her body. So her upper torso and head were still attached. And he he does not dump those body parts. And then he goes and drives to 6th and Western and calls Mr. Parker for another ransom exchange that's going to happen at Manhattan Place and um, 5th Street, which again is sort of Koreatown area. Um, so I want to kind of break here before we go on to what happened so that night. So you guys can tell us a little bit about Elysian Park. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a big, you know, um, staple of Los Angeles as far is, as our yeah. history and, and, um, just the topography of, <laughs> of the city. Um, but kind of like where it is in the city, how it functions today and a little bit of the right. history of maybe what it would have been like in 1927. Sure, I could talk about that. Uh, Elysian Park is just what, like maybe two or three miles away from the downtown center. Uh, it is one of the last. It, I think it is the last remaining parcel of land from the uh, land grant that, like, from the Spanish days, like King Carlos the Third when he signed off the. Like, yeah, this could be a pueblo, sure. Like that piece of Elysian Park is still. That's the last piece of it. Um, when uh, eighteen forty nine, when it, we become part of America, when we become a United State. Um, they want usually what they do after they secularize the area, they started getting rid of all the mission land and started selling it off. They either sell off or auction off or give away pieces of land, but they, they didn't do that for Elysian park. And a lot of people are like, Oh, cause it's so beautiful, but actually it's really hilly. There's lots of like deep, deep canyons and you can't develop on it. So they're just like, well, let's just save this for something else. Um, it gets established in like 1886 around the time. But the, there was a big push in the country because of like John Muir and um, Charles Lummis. They were trying to like beautify everything and preserve parkland. So they said, well, we'll do that for this little area here. So we got Elysian Park established as like a parkland, a public parkland. Um, as we got, we also got like Hollenbeck Park and Boyle Heights and Westlake Park, which is now MacArthur Park. Uh, Griffith Park came around, I think, 18, I want to say 96. And that's much larger. Like uh, Elysian Park is about 550 acres. Griffith Park is about 4,000 acres, a little more than 4,000 acres. So it's vast. So it's kind of like a, the smaller little brother to Griffith Park. Uh, if you're wondering where it's at, if you don't know um, specifically, it's where Dodger Stadium is now. Um, before Dodger Stadium came in the 50s, there was a small uh, Mexican community there called Chavez Ravine that was just pretty much redlined and, and torn down which was a big controversy. There's that book, uh, Stealing Home, from Eric Nosbaum that came out recently about that. Mm -hmm. um, around the time of the Parker murder, when the, the limbs were dumped there, you know, the police academy had just opened, and that was uh, pushed by uh, the chief of police at the time, or I, I, I think it was the chief of police at the time, um, Tugun Davis, Jim Tugun yeah. Davis, who was not a great guy, kind of a kind of an asshole, <laughs> if you allow me to say that. Um, uh, yeah, please. But a great shot. <laughs> you could say he was an expert marksman. <laughs> expert marksman. Morally, but with a gun, he's really good. Um, so that that's starting to come out just about the twenties. So there's a community there. It's not just you, you know just is developed in the middle. There's also like a botanical garden, the Chavez Ravine Arbor uh, Arboretum. Excuse me. Uh, was there because of the um, horticultural society. So it's a good mix of like, you know, there's people living here. There's some things kind of stirring. There's a police academy. Roads are starting to be laid down and it's just a big, beautiful park. Um, I'm not quite sure. You know, I've always was very park is my, I know, I grew up in Echo Park. I've always been curious where he dumped those specific parts, but I, I've never really figured that out. But it, I know that it's, uh, it's, you know, 
maybe five minutes from the Bellevue Arms where he killed her. So it's yeah. obvious that like, well, this is just this is just a good place to just toss some limbs out the window. And it's I not think a, so. Yeah, like it's hard to picture kind of what it even looked like then. Um, yeah, but from from what I read, kind of what I have pictured and put together is that he kind of went from his apartment like up Sunset Boulevard and yeah. then not he I, I think it was like within 200 feet of entering right. sort of what Elysian Park was at the time yeah that, yeah it was just kind of dumped in the the brush there yeah I'm like, I'm even wondering if he went up what is that um Beaudry Beaudry goes by mm -hmm. the you know the east side market then you're suddenly in the hills that are over overlooking the naval reserve which is if anybody doesn't know 1940s the naval reserve is where the sailors left to go participate in the zutsu riots but that area is very hilly and i'm wondering if he just dropped it you know a lot of the photos i've seen they're all on a slope so i'm wondering mm -hmm. if that was the area where yeah um but yeah that's that's Elysian park and uh it, it makes sense dumped it there it was just that was just his body dump that time and that's not a popular body dump as far as i know it was just just on yeah the, someone like, was asking in the body. chat they <laughs> thought um didn't the hillside stranglers dump one of their victims over there. Echo Park is where they dumped one of the people I, uh, on the other side of <laughs> on the other side of Baxter Street, which is one of the steepest streets in L.A. Uh, was, you know, I drive people past that point. But like, you know, Hillside Strangler dumped Kimberly Martin down here. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was just that's also just five minutes away. Daniel, you were laughing at the Hillside Strangler <laughs> question. Because I, I always the drive all the time. Hillside Strangler. <laughs> Because it's like they, they, yeah, they they dumped it very close to uh, where Greg used to live. Yes. So it, it's a, now, it's a place near and dear to my heart. <laughs> now I I moved to a place where their auto shop is two blocks away. So I'm always kind of in the periphery of those two guys. There you go. One of them lived very close to my grandmother over in um, Glendale. So, really? Yeah, in the hills over there. I Let's don't have any connection to them. Uh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not close to any serial killers. Ah, uh, well, loser. You never mm, know. Sign of a yeah. serial killer. Yeah, you're a serial killer. That's what they could tell. There you go. It's the hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, I um, big Dodger fan. Shannon is calling me out in the uh, chat here. Didn't Doctor Shiloh promise? she and her brother were going to get Dodger tattoos when they won the World Series. Uh-oh. I have my appointment next Monday on the 31st. I'm following through Shannon. Before at least spring training starts for this next season, I got to follow <laughs> through. So uh, it's going to be a Mike posted. Piazza. It's going to be I know. I, some players not even on the team mm, anymore. I know. <laughs> no, I would definitely go with Vin Scully's face if I was going with someone's oh, yeah, that's portrait. True. <laughs> isn't uh, isn't baseball know. in a lockout now or something? Yes, so we'll see. So you're off the hook training. until <laughs> no tattoos until the union gets what it wants. Oh God, I tried to do it before they were no longer the champions, but <laughs> whatever, COVID, you know. Um, all right, so the ransom meet. Um, basically, Mr. Parker parks along the curb of where he's supposed to meet Hickman. Um, Hickman's identity is still unknown, unknown obviously, right. to, to cops. Um, and the suspect pulls up right next to him, facing the opposite way. So, like, their their windows are next to each other. Mm -hmm. And Hickman, right away, points a shotgun in Mr. Parker's face, demands the money. And in the darkness, Mr. Parker looks into the car and thinks that he can see Marion in the front seat of the car and even asks, is that my daughter? And Hickman said, yes, she's asleep. Um, and there's some accounts that Hickman or Parker asked like to kind of hear her voice sort of thing. And he says, she's asleep. She's fine. Collects the money from Parker and then drives about 200 feet up, stops. Parker can hear the door open and then close and basically Hickman had just kind of rolled her body out what was left of her body um, and speeds off into the night. So Parker flips around, goes over to the spot and sees the outline of his little girl. However, again, trigger warning, um, she was just a torso and a head and her arms and legs had been removed 
as well as, like I said before, sort of below her belly button. And additionally, what he had done was he had taken wire and put it through her eyelids and put that wire up over her head and attached it to a cloth that was sort of like around her neck mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, mimic that her eyes were open, which is odd because he said that she was asleep, but none of this makes a lot of sense, I guess. Um, I, I also read that he, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. That he was smart enough to not sew her eyes wide open because it would look like she was scared. So he did it like halfway to look like kind of like oh, she was calm, which is hard to argue later that you're insane, but you have enough intelligence to be like, eh, she should look not scared when I sew her right? eyes open. Yeah. Again, like the planning and the organization for sure. Exactly. Um, so the coroner, A.F. Wagner, who conducted the autopsy, was the next door neighbor of the Parkers. Oh, so man. he had seen Marion and her sister grow up um, and it was yeah. just accounts or that it was, he was very, very traumatized by this whole situation. Um, so obviously like the police come down after that, they realize that marion has been murdered. Um, the autopsy shows that a shirt and a towel had been stuffed up inside of Miriam. Uh, mm -hmm. basically they're thinking, you know, to stop the bleeding, but the towel said mm -hmm. Bellevue apartments on it. It was stitched with, <laughs> with where they came from. Um, and then the next day her body parts from that had been tossed into Elysian park were found mm -hmm. wrapped up in newspaper tied with black thread. And once these details came out, I mean, like Scott was telling us in, in the intro that this was just immediately nationwide news. I mean, yeah. so horrific, but within a matter of days and kudos to them for, you know, especially this time period, yeah. they had linked fingerprints from the dumped stolen car to fingerprints in his apartment at um, Bellevue apartments, um, as well as they found Brazil nut shells in Marion's pocket oh. of the little dress that she was wearing. And they right. found the, the same nuts in the apartment of his. Um, so really from then on, they had Hickman identified and the manhunt yeah. was kind of on. Um, the governor called this the most horrific, horrific crime to ever happen in California. There's rumor that the mob was so outraged of this man <laughs> doing this, his little girl, that they were like, um, let us take care of this. <laughs> if we find him first, like, you know, full on like lynching yeah. sort of situation. Isn't that what the movie M is? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's um, it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, you know who would know that is uh, Hickman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Big yes. movie buff. <laughs> big movie buff. Big yeah. Peter Laurie fan. <laughs> totally. Um, so, and even, you know, the police, like, the very corrupt police department yeah. of this era, we're basically like, we're willing to do anything to bring this guy to justice. He, right. no, nobody was having any um, sympathy for this guy. So, yeah. um, what Hickman had done is he had dumped his car and then he stole another car, which was the thing that he did. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, when he was doing all of his robberies and he fled to the Pacific Northwest and he was eventually captured in a small town in Oregon by right. the police chief there, um, was pulled over and recognized because his face was just plastered everywhere. And then the Los Angeles law enforcement task force, sheriffs, LAPD, the DAs, um, they extradited him back by train to stand trial here in Los Angeles. Um, there's a lot more history on the DA at the time that is super interesting. Right. Not enough time here today. <laughs> um, but if Scott and I were, we went down to the, the, the sheriff's museum. We were able to view the autopsy photos um, and it was very, very surreal. Not just that yeah. lucky you. I know. <laughs> not just that we were looking at these autopsy photos, but as we're real, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, as we're sitting there with the historian, he's like, "Oh, by the way, this this basement we're in used to be the coroner's office. So that autopsy happened 
right there. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> right. Yeah. I've. Uh, oh, and, I'm and pretty by the way, sense. Oh, yeah. And they also had the cell where Hickman was held Whoa, that had been really? reconstructed as part of a museum and put there in the basement. And it was, it was freaky. It was yeah. really a, a bizarre experience. Huh. That's Wait, can, you sent that picture to me, and the first thing I thought of was at the Hollywood Museum. They have Hannibal Lecter's cell recreated in the basement. Oh and I was gosh, like, this do is, they? <laughs> this is uh, this is I pretty. Need to get to I, that. I've seen this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was um, it was really crazy. So this is at the Hall of Justice, and the the museum's closed right now. They're they're in the process of sort of recategorizing everything, and then probably ultimately moving, um, yeah. which is kind of sad because it's such a historic building and yeah. a lot of that stuff took place down there. Um, the coroner's inquests and, and the autopsies, but yeah, they've had a, a section of cells brought down from what was the 10th floor where people were wow. held and brought down to the museum. And Hickman's cell is also the cell that uh, Gordon Northcutt from the Wineville chicken coop murders they both same wow. were in that same cell. Um, and it's it the only one. Him. Yeah, it's the only one left yeah. that has like the original beds that kind of have this crisscross mm. pattern. All the other ones were replaced with just full, you know, steel. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll definitely like po after this, we'll post those on social media too. Yeah, great. Um, Scott, you want to talk a little bit more about Hickman? Yeah, let's go back a little bit on the motives for his crimes, or at least what he reported to be the motives for his crimes during the trial process. First, he just said it, the ransom money, he needed to get money so that he could go to the movies because they were very important to them. And then he started shifting to saying that he was actually going to use the money for college. Right. And then, like you were saying earlier, Shiloh, he had said that the urge simply came over him in the moment. He was unable to control the urge, and it was just like he was having an out-of-body experience. Right. Then later, in his formal confession, he wrote that he needed to kill her in order to avoid capture. And then lastly, in a letter written to the court, he spoke of what he called a great providence that was a spirit that spoke directly to him and who guided his actions to fulfill a fate that would bring light to the American criminal justice system. <laughs> Oh, wow. What a social yeah. justice warrior. What a well, hero. <laughs> I, I have to say, it actually is very interesting because I, we did touch on briefly about how messed up they were in, for one thing, small police departments had no idea of the presumption of innocence and guilt. I mean, until proven guilty sure. or proven otherwise. So from the moment he was captured, he was encouraged to tell his story over and over again, oh, right. okay. which ultimately could have worked in his favor later on. But everything that he gave like was so radically different each time he talked, not necessarily like um, lying and making up facts. It was just always like a different motivation. It really pointed right. to the fact that this guy was really driven by really believe he was full blown narcissist. There was a lot of mm -hmm. other stuff going on, but real, incredibly self-centered and a real lack of empathy for other people um so he didn't about, want to go to college i guess why would he need to if, criminal if he, justice he, major if great <laughs> providence is uh is you know steering him why would he need to and in, in the book that we read in wilson's book the extensive mm -hmm. research is able to set up a very much a, a more three-dimensional perspective on this case mm -hmm. and while there's absolute brutality in this crime it clearly indicates, like I was saying earlier, a lack of empathy and a regard or lack of regard for life. Yeah. Um, so any other statement that he makes should be taken with a huge dose of salt. Did he really um, what we would call grandiosity as a repul as a result of like bipolar mania, maybe mm -hmm. alternating with periods of depression? I mean, it's possible, but it's always it's also very, very clear that through the process, he decided it was going to be in his favor to present as mentally ill mm -hmm. and impaired, so far impaired that he wouldn't be able to go through with the trial. This was like the beginning, really, of going for the insanity defense. Right. Um, and his motivation there clearly would be 
let me get sent to a cushy mental institution rather than going to prison to await the death penalty. Yeah. So we just as a real quick uh, refresher for our listeners on the the NGI or NGRI, which is not guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity. This was the first trial for the first insanity plea in the state of California. So it, it was a really big deal. And that revolves around um, an English standard of law from the 1800s called the Monoton Rule. And the Monoton defense is the rule created as a reaction to the acquittal in 1843 of Daniel Monoton. And he had been charged with murdering an Edward Drummond. And Mr. McNaughton was an individual with a clear, fixed delusion that he was part of a secret organization that would bring about the elimination and destruction of the royal family. And the court was able to determine at that time that there was no such organization that existed except in his mind. Yeah. And at the end of this very long trial, they acquitted him of wrongdoing on the grounds that he was not able to understand the difference between right and wrong. Mm-hmm. And that was demonstrated by his multiple delusional statements when he was brought in front of the court. So um, the idea, we have to understand that when attempting to understand what we now see as competency, I'm using this term competency to competent to stand trial, it was an alien concept to the general public throughout the world, really. So this was a developing rule or developing um, understanding of law and defense over a period of years. Uh, but like when Monoton was found not guilty by reason of insanity at that time, it caused a huge uproar in England and it, it started echoing around the world pretty much. Now, his mental health history, like formal evaluation, here's where it gets like really juicy because the defense is only has a little bit of money. They're only able to get uh, four doctors. Prosecution has eight <laughs> experts. It. Yeah. How many do you have? Death by expert. <laughs> Jesus. Right. And everybody is, of course, they're, they're, I'm sure there are a few literal guns for hire there as far mm-hmm. as like they're here to present it. But there was some really, really quite brilliant commentary on his actions by some of the alienists or early psychologists, psychiatrists that were working there. Um, the defense was trying to say that he had dementia precox, mm-hmm. which was like sort of this early definition or diagnosis that li- would eventually lead to schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. But the weird thing about dementia precox, which was you know an idea that came up with Freud, was that Freud even left the idea open that it might be the influence from an outside source that is something we don't understand. Basically, Freud was saying there might be ghosts in your blood. You should do some cocaine to fix this. That's the way I think My he was. Favorite That's our guy. Ever. That's, That's our, our guy. guy. <laughs> That's our guy. Uh, also, like it leaves the door open for saying that um, he might be a victim of demonic possession. Um, even Carl Jung, who was another, it was a famous disciple of for a while of Freud's went on to, you know, sort of support this type of defense. Um, There was a really great back and forth uh, between the cross examinations of all of these doctors that I think is worth reading the book alone. It's Mm -hmm. just pages and pages. It's actual just transcripts and it's fascinating stuff. Um, But clearly they tried to say that he had uh, command auditory hallucinations that were telling him to kill Marion, that were telling him to do these things, and then he had these drives. I absolutely, in my clinical opinion, do not believe it at all. He had written a note to another uh, inmate at the jail that was like, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for playing crazy. Watch me get off. I'm gonna be really good at this." Yeah. Do you think so, that's a good idea? <laughs> Mark, yes or no? Yeah, fox. Yeah. <laughs> and sign the sign the fox. Ha ha. See you tomorrow. Like, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. So as much as we like to give him credit for being pretty well organized, clearly he didn't have a lot of insight into like a jailbird is going to sing on you immediately no. for this huge trial. He didn't watch so, that movie. No. Uh, no. no, clearly. <laughs> now, there's another big thing that I think is important to talk about here that that you guys can comment on as well is about uh, the big social 
uh, narrative that was going on at the time that movies were what called the, caused this because he was in that darkened theater and he was watching all these crime movies and he was absolutely like that. That was the reason is it like, this is what's poisoning our country. It's poisoning our youth. And even today, I mean, like it is a hundred years later and that argument still comes up. It comes up about video games and mm -hmm. we have definitive research on this that shows that the the nexus that you have to be concerned about with violence and exposure to media or some outside influence that is like visual or engaging is about something else that already exists in the person so it might be the trigger but it's not what caused it you know video games don't don't cause killers but it gives them an outlet that may lead to something else, but the damage has already been done by the time they're playing the video games. Yeah. And we know that now. Um, what we do know is that in today's modern society, kids who play video games, some of them that may have a predisposition to other disorders will be shown to have a decrease in empathy and other socially desirable behaviors. So I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, this guy probably was wired with a lack of empathy. Don't know oh, if yeah. he had dark triad traits or anything, but clearly he was functioning without a lot of compassion. He had definitely some criminogenic thinking and this idea of entitlement because he went into that life of crime at age 17, almost overnight, it seems like. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a lot said about his mom being ill I look at it as mother was probably depressed herself. Maybe she had some bipolar, maybe she had some episodes. Dad says, I can't handle this anymore, I'm out of here. And he goes and starts another family. But there's no real history that supposedly there are all these relatives that had um, mental illness and that he was the result of this. What they were doing was pulling out medical diagnoses of his cousins and such that maybe had epilepsy. Um, now, the other thing is that his family was very highly religious and engaged in going to evangelical tent revivals. And his mother would get so worked up that she wouldn't be able to sleep. She'd be walking around the house all night, um, swinging knives and saying things. So that's got to be difficult for a kid. But once again, it's just an element. There are plenty of kids that live through traumatic and challenging episodes but their inner resiliency doesn't end up resulting in this a brutal, brutal type of murder like this. Right. Yeah. Daniel, did you say you had some stuff on just the influence and what happened with the movie industry as a result of this I, crime? I do, but I feel like Greg should start it because I need to turn a light on in my room. We're losing you. We're exactly. totally it's, using. I'm turning into a Renaissance painting. Like, do it. Do it. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be right back. Again, it's the hair, though, <laughs> to be fair. The curse, the gift. <laughs> I'll be right back. I almost want to talk a little bit about his, I, like his, as you were talking about, his grandiosity and his sort of entitlement. Yes. And how much of that really comes to people seeing that you can come to Los Angeles and you too can have all these things and you can mm. be on the big screen. And I, I work in a movie theater and I'm watching these people on the screen and me too, and I can make that happen for me. And I wonder how much... There's boosterism. And there's also that I like. I, I don't want to say magical thinking, but there's sort of element of like I, I'm big. I'm a big deal. I'm a big deal to me. I can go and do that too. And I wonder how much of that goes into a lot of other, you know, sort of similar situations. But I also just a comment on the movies. Um, nobody was watching. What what movie were they watching when they did the Spanish Inquisition? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> what, what movies or video games they were playing when they did that? Is the I hear the, the puppet. Sh I hear the puppet sh <laughs> brutal at that. <laughs> the puppet of the Christ. Uh, oh my god! Now, Greg, I'm back. You can shut up. Uh, <laughs> my god. The the stuff the stuff I had. I don't know. You probably said everything I'm about to say in the amount of time it took me to turn my light on. But <laughs> the things I had about like movies and louis b meyer was that he was he seemed to be concerned about like the polished image like the wholesome right. not necessarily wholesome but just like the polished image of hollywood because like it was still pretty much in its early days like the movie industry and he wanted he didn't want like negative press around it because like it 
you know, movies didn't have to happen. Like it could have been <laughs> like, you know, it could have been a thing for a few years. Could have been a phase. People, yeah, yeah, people hated it and it never took off. So he yeah. like he was uh hell bent on making sure that didn't happen. <laughs> But he, he, so like uh, the thing I saw, like he, you know, he's helped found the Academy of the Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to sort of give it like this polish and make it a legitimate thing mm -hmm. and like sort of elevate the status. And then, yeah, like you were saying, he was freaking out because Hickman was like, I love movies. And <laughs> Louis B. Myers, and I look at like, what I did. <laughs> and Louis B. Myers, like, I make movies. This is <laughs> oh, not no. good. Oh, crap. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, like you were saying, it, the the thing that came to mind was like Columbine and the Marilyn Manson thing of like, right. this is all his fault. Like this is kids shouldn't listen to music anymore. Kids shouldn't dance in this little town anymore. But <laughs> he he like he wanted to get in front of all this before it started right. being bad for business. It seemed. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, hold it together. <laughs> My mic off because I was snorting like a board just now. It was really funny. Just want to dance. That's but, a but it was, it was uh, the, uh, uh, more inappropriate jokes could be made about that. I already time. saw the pain oh, in, your, in your eyes and I said, like, don't do it. <laughs> but I've learned. Um, <laughs> it, it's also, it was a weird transition time for movies mm -hmm. because like, like the newsreels were showing footage of this of this murder right. and then it's like okay and now here comes harold lloyd and guy hanging from a clock above downtown la like you're gonna show a little girl chopped up and then show like a wacky buster keaton movie i can't believe that they showed that like it, i'm it, desensitized and i've seen a picture of her on a slab when she's just like a head and and a torso and like yeah. i threw a book like i can't believe <laughs> And they showed that on a newsreel at the time. That's right. insane. It's crazy. But I mean, I know that's always the blowback was bad. Yeah, I, hope like, so. I, I imagine because <laughs> that that's been like the debate of. Um, I took I took one media journalism class in college, but that's been like the debate of uh, like what where where is the line of what right. you can um, port show in a newspaper or like what people are watching as they're eating cereal in the morning. Like, what can you show on the news? Like that, yeah. there was a high speed chase just the other night in L in in the valley. What? What? They, they were shocking. <laughs> surprising, I know. Just uh, one. <laughs> well, I was going to say that the two high speed chases crashed into each other, but that's kind of <laughs> what happened. And they showed a guy dying on live TV, like he flew off his mic his motorcycle. I know. So it, it's it's like it, like you were saying, this whole thing has been going on for a hundred years, and it sort of felt like this was uh, almost a. Uh, one of those like maturing moments, like growing right. pain moments in LA, like the Manson murders were, right. where it was kind of like the fun, the fun was over of po post World War II Los Angeles. You Santa. can't put a stranger's World kid War in your car. I mean, we can't do that yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> nope. um, but yeah, he was saying, yeah, he, but Meyer was fighting against it because he didn't want censorship of uh, what they could, because that would also be bad for him. Like, it's bad. It's kind of confusing because he didn't want the negative press, but he also was afraid of censorship. So I don't know. I, I mean, that's yeah. I'm not the head of MGM, so I don't know <laughs> how to make those decisions. Did you guys also um, hear about or come across in your reading about the fire in the Canadian theater, yeah, which I happened did, like yeah. right before this? It happened where, earlier in the year, yeah. Yeah, so it was like 70 children died on this school field trip to a yeah. movie theater because of this fire. And so that already had, not that like that has anything to do with the no, film it, or anything <laughs> like that, but it was like this, oh my gosh, this immoral culture and what were kids yeah. doing in a movie theater anyway? And they, it, it sounded like it, they it, wanted to blame something. It was the right combination of words of like dead children and cinema. And they're like, that's yeah. the same story. Myers but is it, like, no, yeah, no. It, it is we like who, because as we, uh, I had more questions about like his motivation, but you already covered it. Yeah. But like, who is to blame? Like, he just seems almost like, uh, to quote another movie, pure evil. Like, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like he had a good reason for doing what he did. So, who do you blame? But uh, Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did. There was another quote I wanted I wanted to share as well that 
was that I found on another site. Um, when the LAPD were extraditing him back to, to um, Southern California, there was a detective, uh, Herman Klein, mm -hmm. who was sitting with him uh, on the train from Oregon. And Hickman goes, well, what do the people of California want with me? And Herman <laughs> said, they want we your don't. life. Yeah. Rightly or wrongly, that's what they want. And apparently the reported response was that Hickman had a smug grin on his face and he said, was it any worse than what Leopold and Loeb did? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So look, I mean, once again, I want to hear say this with a grain of salt. It's on a website. I wasn't able to source it beyond two other points. Yeah. But if that is actually something that he said, which would actually match something that Shiloh's going to share with you about what we learned at the museum. Mm -hmm. This guy's a psychopath. Yeah. You yeah. know, a high functioning psychopath. He was able to contain himself. And we know that, yeah, trauma can make things worse for these kind of individuals, but yeah. it, it is a brain structure and chemical structure in their functioning that leads to these types of behaviors or opens the door to it. Yeah. And uh, Herman Klein, I think I read that, you know, his nickname was Harboiled Herman, uh, wept when he found out that they had killed Marion, yeah. sobbing. Mm. It's on the internet, so I don't know yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, that broke that guy. Yeah, it happens. I mean, there's the, the toughest, most stoic detectives that have seen some shit. And once you bring in child crimes, and especially yeah. like, Think about like the buildup that happened with this. You know, you you have the kidnapping, then you have like the first ransom attempt and exchange, and people are just hoping like, okay, let's give this idiot fifteen hundred dollars and get this little girl back. And like, they're getting there, there's proof of life because she's writing notes. Um, so I think everyone was like the community and the you know, was just hoping that this would resolve. So yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure those reports are probably true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the historian at the Sheriff's Museum said that he had, in in some of his statements, basically idolized Leopold and Loeb. And um, there were some comments there. Um, and Northcutt, right? Yeah. And I was He's trying like, to... Isn't, isn't this the cell where Northcutt was? I think he Once like, they was told him that, he was... That. Yeah, he was like impressed with that. So, you know, you have like sort of this this inspiration perhaps from mm -hmm. other killers of children really yeah. i mean that were happening at this time so yeah. um so uh, just like the coolest thing that i want to talk about that this historian told us a story um was he had gotten in contact with Hicks hickman's great nephew and the nephew said that his family never spoke about this. Like they basically erased Hickman from their family history. He oh was doing God. some genealogy work and started <laughs> finding the newspaper articles and realizing what a huge deal this was. So he gets in contact with this historian from the sheriff's department and he ends up coming out here and going to the Bellevue apartments in 2009. Oh. Uh -huh. Yes, when they're renovating them. And his apartment, I think it was apartment 315, was still there. So his great nephew is there inside the apartment when they're renovating. And from a vent, a piece of fabric falls out. And the um, the nephew, I, did, he, did he keep it, Scott? I can't remember. Either he described it or he showed it to the historian at the sheriff's department. Yeah. And it was polka dot material. And the historian oh. brings out the pictures of Marion and it was her sleeve from oh her dress God. in a vent Horrifying. until 2009. Oh this is God. like how the sequel starts. Oh <laughs> my gosh. I know. So like he had just come home and like shoved oh. a bunch of crap up there probably. And um, no one checked no one checked right? for what 80 years in their in their vent <laughs> bananas i know oh i know God. i thought that was just like crazy um so yeah just a, a I, I wild have, wild story i have two little things to add before i have absolutely nothing left to contribute Please, the, let's have it all get him out of I, here I, I vaguely remember that the johnny cochran school i think 
um, just a weird side note, was built on the house that Wyatt Earp lived in when he moved to L.A. Or like he lived right next door to it, Whoa. which is also another thing that Wyatt Earp moved to L.A. <laughs> but yeah. Um, also, Edgar Rice Burroughs covered this case for the L.A. Examiner. That's which right. Which was mm. pretty interesting. Yeah, that's right. Writer of yeah. Tarzan. So the Tar- the school. Writer of John Carter from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> So the Johnny Cochran school is on the land where this where Marion school was Mount Vernon. So Wyatt Earp is probably yeah. next door. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think he like lived across the street or something like that. Our friend. I'm, that, I'm vaguely remembering this. Yeah. yeah. Scott and I have a friend that lives over in that little pocket Lafayette square. Right. Is it, dog ho- across the street. is it dog holiday? No. <laughs> you don't have to tell us on this podcast. Clean after later if it is dog holiday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> Calamity Jane. <laughs> um, God, anything else to add, you guys? Any little tidbits that you came up with? Well, I hate right. William Hickman. I don't know if that's anything to add that I disagree with you guys, but I hate I, William Hickman after hearing it for the millionth time. Uh, you just... <laughs> I don't like him. I, uh, okay. I was rereading um, <laughs> Hard Stance, but I was rereading uh, you know, a little bit about, about the case and everything, and I, I never read about... Uh, <laughs> him dying about, about his execution and that was just as I mean, not just uh, as brutal it was also very upsetting to read about that um and it didn't none of this case makes me feel good well I, that's you know, a when, great point there's um, nothing to feel good about there i don't think there's anything redeeming yeah in this no. at all i don't well, know did, my reaction when i heard that the hanging didn't go as it was supposed to and he suffered i was like oh poor, poor guy <laughs> you know whatever did school <laughs> policies at least change from this of like you can't pick up twins or something it did at that school <laughs> it was very specific <laughs> well i mean it, it the security certainly um that, that i mean that's a whole other rabbit hole about yeah like, can you imagine that poor teacher like I mean, that was and she consulted with another school person and they both decided that it was okay in this emergency yeah, yeah it's got to be it would have been horrific hor- they... in fact there's a really haunting photo of her that we <laughs> saw in the files uh, this woman, you know, yeah, dressed okay. in 1920s garb, very matronly looking. And she, it is an incredibly haunted look yeah. on this woman's mm-hmm. face. I think they had to but, sedate her after that because she was just hysterical because <laughs> oh, she sure. like, couldn't believe that. That's she also what I, I forgot. I have one more thing I want to ask. <laughs> Did, does anybody know how the other, the, the, her twin felt? Like it could have been, you know, could have been her one. Yeah. Yeah. We, we asked the historian at the sheriff's museum what you know what kind of happened to her and he said the family really laid low um i think they ended up at least the mom and the sister kind of went to go live in pasadena like i think Mm -hmm. to just get sort of get away from los angeles and parker stayed um for a while not that they were split up yeah um but we did see uh, adult photos of the sister um I'm so sorry. I'm blanking on her name. I think it was like Marjorie. Marjorie. Marjorie thank you. Um, Marjorie. Yeah. So I, we know I think she. she yeah, I think she ended up settling in San Diego area, um, mm. is what we heard. But gosh, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. The the sur- survivor's guilt type, you know, stuff must That's have been great. there as well as just the trauma of losing yeah. a sibling in that manner. Yeah. Poor family, and I think. Perry Parker died pretty young, um, from what I remember. Like you know, fifties, something like right. that. But horrible. There, there was a lot that happened at this time. I, mean, I think that's a great question. Did it change? Did it change school rules? It did for that certain school. But you know, I grew up in the South in the sixties, and ba- anybody could pick you up from school. There was no <laughs> checking at all. I mean, that's that's a relatively new phenomenon. And what I found interesting, because there is this parallel process or parallel uh, event of the Canadian theater catching on fire with all the kids inside and 80 yeah. something kids died. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so there was um, there were rules that went into place and stayed in place for almost 60 years that children mm-hmm. under 12 could not go into a theater alone, which was gone by the time I was a kid because <laughs> my mom would like. 
I'm getting you out of the house and drop me off at the theater yeah. for 50 You're cents see to Midnight watch. Midnight Cowboy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to watch movies all day. So it's, it's interesting how like horrible events like this, you think, well, wow, that's going to change everything. And then you get this bigger picture and you realize like, wow, no, it, it really <laughs> only affected this certain group of people in this certain geographic mm-hmm. area for this amount yeah. of time. Good point. Yeah. One last thing that I think would resonate with uh, some of our listeners and Patreon members that did the downtown LA walking tour with us. So we did this um, true crime sort of paranormal downtown walking tour Mm-hmm. with a bunch of our listeners last year and we ended up you you go to a couple places and then you stop and eat you know it, right. and we stopped in the I forget if they call it the spring street or the broadway arcade between fifth and right. sixth downtown yeah yeah there's a um, gosado's tacos in there now and some other places um really cool area that they've redone with a bunch of restaurants well when hickman after he rolled Marion's body out, went downtown, dumped the car off, he then went to the Lincoln Cafe right after that. And that was in the arcade at the time. Wow. Really? So he kind of laid low for a little bit before he stole his car and took off up north. It's hmm. good it's good to know that there's a I'll be eating there soon because you just told yeah. me there's a Gisado, so Thank you for that. I'm always learning new things. (laughs) Not too far from the other one, but. (laughs) I'm seeing Shannon and Emily mention some things um, regarding paranormal stuff. Are are the the wonderful docent detect uh, deputy that we spoke with said that he's not a believer, but there's some shit going on around all that stuff. He said that (laughs) things move, they fall just he said like there is no absolutely no denying that something's going on down here it can, can i tell you creepy. the story of that cell real quick so yeah. he so he said he's like this cell is very very active um and he's like huge dude like big just, guy you know big guy yeah. bald and he's like i am not a believer i'm a skeptic and i'm like <laughs> i believe it um but he said that they had one of the metal food trays propped up on the top bunk one night and just heard it fly and it was in the middle of the cell and then he said another not not in a position where it could have fallen it was uh, it had been thrown yeah it it was poltergeist across the room yeah Yeah. yes yes (laughs) and then he had gotten a new supervisor down there um he's like who was a bigger skeptic than me and so the deputy we were speaking to he said that he had walked by the cell and saw like a shadow of like, as if someone was standing inside the cell and the shadow was coming out and he thought, Oh, like it must be the cleaning crew or whatever. And then walks by the cell is now in line with it. The shadow disappears. And he said it was like walking into a refrigerator as he's walking by. And so he goes to go tell the new Lieutenant who had come down. He's like, oh my God, I just saw a shadow. Like, it's cold. You have to come over. And the guy was like, whatever. And he goes over there, like, let me see what you're talking about. And then that guy gets shoved by something (laughs) and was like, never seen again (laughs) working there. (laughs) Like, transferred out. That's perfect. Um, So I can imagine working in a place that old where they did autopsies. You guys, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I, I was, I'm sorry to interrupt. Stop I was going to say, yeah, we've got to have you back again, especially, you know, every summer we try and do um, vintage uh, crime stories about LA. Please come back. I think you added just an, an incredible layer to what we're doing here. Well, we've and, got to um, top. We've got to have fun. an even more horrific murder next time. Okay. We've got to top ourselves. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's plenty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having us. Of course, of course. Um, at, at long at, last. Yes. Thank you guys for sticking around <laughs> this long. We totally appreciate it. I'm going to put your website here in the chat for everyone again. Um, so everybody can, hopefully you know, can check you out if they haven't already and learn everything they want to know about Los Angeles. 
<laughs> from hot dogs to ice cream. <laughs> what kind of things do you guys, what are you working on like next or what's coming Strangely up? enough, we're doing parks in the next episode. So Elysian Park, Greg's doing that. But I, as we are talking, you mentioned MacArthur Park and I was like, Ooh. we forgot to cover MacArthur Park. <laughs> that could be its own this. episode. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. really. You should. That should be its own episode. Yep. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you guys. Anything else you'd like to add before we go? Let me check my notes. <laughs> um, Let me get my book. <laughs> it looks Let's... like you're tickling him. You're reaching across. <laughs> Let me just uh, tickle my Greg. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go over this whole thing one more time? So, yeah, sure. No problem. Start from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, it was a pleasure. And thank you to everybody who hung out with us here on Get Vocal and over on Facebook. Um, we will put out this audio on our Patreon as soon as our editor is over COVID and we're wishing him well and um, eventually we'll get video up on YouTube too. So thank you, Greg, Zach Efron, so much for being here. <laughs> Appreciate it. You, Please call me the fox. <laughs> you got it. Zach the fox. The fox and the hound. Got it. That's you your got name, it. Name, the fox and the hound. <laughs> All right, you guys. Good night. Take care. Good night. Bye. Thank you.